Yeah, the outdoor activities. I am um, counting down the days. What is it, 11 days now till spring? And all this winter stuff is gone, right? <laughs> Last night it was snowing, big flakes at 9 o'clock at my house. I'm thinking, I've got to get to Albany in the morning. <laughs> but then it quit and uh, everything was good. But I don't know about you, but I'm done with winter. <laughs> I am ready to get out on that bicycle and into that kayak and out on the trails. So uh, may it come soon. It is great uh, to be with you this morning. Thank you for that uh, song service this morning. I'm just wondering, Ron, how do you have so much energy at this time of day? Uh, but these hymns are so great. You know, the first two hymns, uh, they're kind of springtime hymns, weren't they? Uh, you know, the gleams of a golden morning and uh, you know, reminding us that winter is just about done. And then the last two, a great Advent hymn, you know, that uh, it's almost time for the Lord to come. I don't know if you watch the news like I do, but you know, the, I think that things are lining up and uh, we're gonna see that day soon. And then what a day of rest and gladness. Part of our health message you know, this Sabbath blessing that the Lord gives to us. So this morning I want to talk about investing in your health. Now, uh, the, my, the initial um, request was that I would uh, come and do some, uh, some presentations on stewardship. You can only talk about money so much, but you realize that stewardship is more than just talking about money, isn't it? You know, it's investing everything about our lives. And so we read the, the text, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When we invest, everything about our lives into our relationship with God, into our call to reach our communities, into our call to reach this world, when everything that we're about is about that call that God has given us, then we are really, really following God's plan for our lives. But I wanna talk about health now specifically. As we invest our health, you know, John wrote these words in the book of John, uh, 3 John, verse 2, where he says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health. Now, you look at that, and you say, well, that's a pretty good introduction. He's writing a letter uh, to someone, apparently. But I believe that the words of Scripture are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Oh, it's not just John writing a letter to a friend. It's God writing a letter to his friends. And that's all of us. And so God is speaking to each one of us individually, where he says, dear friend, whoever you are in this pew, I pray, you know, did you know Jesus prayed and prays for us and he intercedes for us? He says, I pray that you may enjoy good health. Okay, God wants us uh, to enjoy good health. He says, and that all may go well with you in every part of your life, even as your soul is getting along well. You know, as humans, uh, we're not just one part. You know, we're multifaceted. You know, we're, our, our, mental, uh, our mental being is part of us, our physical being and our spiritual being. And what he's saying in this is I want you to enjoy good physical health, I want things to go well for you, and that your spiritual life uh, is getting along well. Let's pray as we begin our presentation this morning. Father, thank you so much for your care for us, that you want us to enjoy good health, that you've given us instructions and you've given us guidance on how we can live according to your principles and that we may fulfill this wish that you have. Lord, as we meet together today and as we consider your word and how you've worked in our lives and want to work in our lives, I pray that you will teach us by the author of this word, your Holy Spirit. May you teach our minds, may you fill our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. I remember seeing Richard out running. Every morning, uh, I would be walking to uh, classes at, at Walla Walla College, and there'd be Richard out running. Um, now, he was a legend around the college among the students there. I went running some. I took jogging class, and, and I ran in high school. I ran track and all of that, and so I did some running. And I knew other students uh, there that uh, did some running. I could not keep up with Richard's running program. I don't know, actually, of any of the other students there that could keep up with Richard's running program. So I wasn't surprised when I heard Richard was going to attempt the world's toughest run. This was in 1986, uh, the world's toughest run. Back then, it was called the Death Valley to Mount Whitney run. Okay, and anyone could just go do it. Now they actually have an organized run uh, that's a race. It's called the Badwater Ultra Marathon. But back then, uh, it, was just, it was just a run. And, and the rules were you started in Death Valley. You'd actually start at a place called Badwater. That's where uh, the ultra marathon got its name. You'd start in Death Valley, 282 feet below sea level. It's the lowest point in the uh, 48 states, and the, right, the run ends 146 miles later at the top of Mount Whitney. Okay, so it's an elevation of 14,495 feet above sea level, the highest point in the 48 states. And so the rules stipulated, okay, you start at the lowest point, you end up at the highest point, you have to complete the run between July 1st and August 31st. <laughs> yeah, the hottest time of the year to actually be considered as someone who, who did the run. So you had, those were the rules. Now in the previous 10 years uh, before Richard tried the run, only 80 other people had tried it. And of those 80, only eight finished it. Okay, so 10% uh, completion rate there. And of the eight, that finished it, the oldest was 48 years old, 20 years younger than 68-year-old Richard, who is attempting this run. Some of you here may, may have known Richard Kegley. Anyone uh, had ever met Richard Kegley? Okay. Uh, if you had spent any time up in Walla Walla College Place, uh, Richard Kegley uh, was a legend up there. His story goes like this. When Richard was 58 years old, 1976, he was laying in a hospital bed. Uh, he was clutching an oxygen mask there in that hospital bed. He'd, he'd suffered from asthma for years. And so he lay in this hospital bed and he's just <gasps> gasping for air. Now wherever Richard went, he carried a, a small pharmacy of medications with him you know, to, to, to keep going but he still had flare-ups, especially in the summertime. Uh, you know, you get the pollen out there, you get the dust up there in the Walla Walla area, and so uh, he's having one of these massive flares enough to put him in the hospital. His medical prognosis was not good. He's 58 years old, but you know, they're telling him, your odds of living a normal life uh, from here on, they're just getting worse. You know, those odds are against him. But there in that hospital bed, as he lay there, he said, I'm going to do something about this. I'm not going to live the rest of my life like this. He decided, I'm going to do something. So as we talk about an investment this morning, what we're talking about is the investment of good health. You know, it's, it's for our benefit, but it's also for the Lord's uh, benefit and for the work of the church. That, you know, if we're, if we're sickly, if we're, you know, if we're always miserable, we can't do what God has called us to do. So as we invest in this, it's a blessing to us. It blesses the church. It blesses God's kingdom. You know, John said those words, I pray that you'll be in good health. Okay, he wanted the people that he was writing to. He wants us to be in good health. Now, we know that God is our creator, 
Okay? He made us. He knows every part of the human body. And he wants us. He knows how this machine works. And he knows how to, to make everything function so that we can be an optimal performance. And so he tells us how to, to live this healthy life, how to achieve this healthy life. Now, Richard Kegley, he went from a hospital bed at the age of 58 to tackling the toughest run in the world at the age of 68. In 10 years, he's made this transition. How did he do it? He began, the first thing he did was he began by reading the book, Ministry of Healing. Are you familiar with that book? <laughs> yeah. Okay, he read the book, and he found this on page 127. Many of you are probably familiar uh, with this passage, uh, where she says, pure air, sunlight, abstemious, ab you know, that was, a, yeah, abstemious, <laughs> Is that? That was a word in 1905 when she wrote this. <laughs> um, it means temperance, moderation, self-control. Not a word that we're familiar with. Abstemiousness, okay? Rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water, trust in divine power. She says these are the true remedies. And so Richard took that. You know, many of you are familiar with this. You know that if you, if you uh, put this all together, you can form the acronym New Start. Okay, so we're going to talk about New Start. It'll be a review for some of you, maybe new for others. But I'm going to add another letter at the end. So we're going to talk about New Start plus F. And you'll have to hang on to the end to find out what the F is. <laughs> But this is what Richard followed to turn his life around physically. And it begins with nutrition. Okay, so back there in Genesis, you know, we have the creation story. And in Genesis 1.29, uh, God gave the outline for the best diet for this human machine that he had created. And so the best diet then was fruits, nuts, and grains. Okay, that's what he told them. He said, that's, you're free to eat this of the garden. Now when, you know how the story goes, they're in the garden for a while, they sin, they get kicked out, and uh, once they're kicked out of the garden, then God adds vegetables to the list. Um, apparently there's something in you know, the nutritional value of what was outside of the garden that uh, the fruits, nuts, and grains apparently didn't have all of that, so the vegetables were added. And so there you have it, fruits, nuts, grains, vegetables, okay, the, the best nutritious diet uh, for this human body. But people will ask me, well, what about the, the clean meats? You know, didn't God, you know, say in Leviticus 11, he outlined uh, some flesh food that uh, were clean for people to eat, and yes, he did. Um, you know, he didn't make a distinction between the clean and the unclean. That's a, that's a whole different Bible study. But um, what you see happening, you know, especially when Noah, you know, and his family get off of the ark. And, uh, you know, there, you know, things are starting to grow again. But they, they needed to supplement their diet. And God allowed Noah uh, to eat, you know, some, some flesh foods. And I think there were other things in the, uh, in the environment that contributed to this. But if you, if you track the lifespans from before the flood to after the flood, you know, they were living 800 years or so uh, longer before the flood than after the flood. And so, you know, sure, you know, Leviticus 11 does allow some flesh food, uh, and it's okay in that sense. But I look at it and say, why settle for okay when you can have the best? You know, I'd like to have some of those 800 years back. Um, and so, really, the, the best diet is that, uh, that vegetarian diet. Now, Richard and his wife were already vegetarians, okay? But they were both overweight. And I'm going to tell you why uh, in a little bit. 
But not only had Richard, you know, had all these, these problems with his asthma attacks and everything, but his wife had, had had four heart attacks already at this stage of life. And so they decided, we've got to do something about this. So they took the next step, uh, and that was, you know, to look at their diet, to look at their, uh, what they were doing nutritionally. And so what they did was they cut out a lot of sugar, and they cut out a lot of fat from their diet. They're already vegetarians, but you know, they were uh, still taking in some things that, were, that was uh, bad for their health. And so what they discovered is proper nutrition is an investment in good health. The E is exercise. In Genesis uh, 2.15, you see there God uh, gave Adam his marching orders. He said, your job is, I think the way it's written, is to tend the garden. Okay, take care of the garden. Now, we're not sure exactly how big the Garden of Eden was, but, it, you know, there's some things in Scripture that, that kind of tell you it's between these rivers and, and this spot and that sort of thing. The closest we can guess from the, uh, the description given in Genesis is that the garden is at least 300 miles wide and 700 miles long. How'd you like to tend the garden like that? <laughs> That's a lot of, you know, I don't know if there's weeds there to pull, but probably some pruning and, you know, some shaping of things. And whatever tending the garden meant, apparently God intended Adam to get a lot of exercise, to be out there active, to be busy uh, taking care of this garden. So when Richard got out of the hospital, uh, he started walking. He really didn't walk much before then. And so he said, I'm going to start walking. So the first day he went out to go walking, he made it around the block. <laughs> that was it. But he kept working at it. And pretty soon he's walking down the street. And before long, he's walking the two miles from his home to his workplace. And then he decided, OK, if I can walk two miles, Maybe I can run. So he decided, I'm going to try running. He made it around the block <laughs> the first time. But then he kept going a little farther and a little farther. And within a few months, his wife had joined him in this, uh, in this uh, health program. Within a few months, Richard had lost 35 pounds. His wife had lost 20 pounds. And they were running marathons. You know how long a marathon is? Yeah, you ever see these cars go by and they've got the little sticker in the window? All it says is 26.2. That means they ran a marathon, 26.2 miles. Okay, so Richard now has gone from his hospital bed to running marathons. His asthma disappeared. During the next 10 years, from the age 58 to 68, Richard ran over 25,000 miles. He ran the Boston Marathon. He ran the Lake Tahoe Run, which is 72 miles. He ran that four times. And then four times he ran what's called six-day races in San Diego. And there he set a new record for men over the age of 60. He ran 331 miles. Getting adequate exercise is an investment toward good health. I'm not saying you got to do what Richard did, but I'm showing you what can happen when you pay attention to these principles that God has given us. The W is water. Water. You know, the promise of God that we read in Revelation 22, 17 is that I give you the water of life freely. What a wonderful metaphor, um, because water is essential to life and health. Now, we all know this. You know, most of your body is water. Here's a terrible illustration I'm going to share with you. If I could wring you out like a sponge, what's left would fit in a bread bag. <laughs> if I could wring all the water out. We're basically just great big walking water balloons. Uh, is what we are. And so if you lose 10% of, uh, 
of your body water, you're in big trouble. If you lose 20%, you're dead. Okay, so water is very critical to good health. Now, water was uh, one of Richard's main concerns on this run that he was doing. Um, he started the run at sundown. You know, when you're down in the Death Valley, you don't run in the day, you run at night. So he began at sunset, uh, and when he began the run at sunset, August the 1st, the air temperature in Death Valley had cooled to 111 degrees, <laughs> okay? The ground, uh, the, the roadway that he was running on was still 180 degrees. By midnight, it had cooled, the air had cooled to 100 degrees, but by then, Richard was dry. Okay, that first, he was dry at midnight. Now, he was drinking eight quarts a day, okay, during this run, but he still wasn't getting enough water. He re that was really a concern for him. So here's a question. Do you get enough water? Uh, you may not have considered this. I had to consider it uh, a few weeks back. Here's how you figure out how to get enough water. You take your weight, you divide it by two, and then whatever that number is, that's how many ounces of water uh, you should be drinking a day. And if you want to know how many glasses that is, divide by eight or whatever your, uh, your drinking utensil is, and that'll tell you how many of those you get. So I was at my doctor, I'm confessing here, a while back, had a little medical issue, and, and so I explained to her, you know, the, the symptoms, what's going on. And I'm expecting, you know, oh, she's going to tell me this, and I might have to, you know, take this medication, blah, blah, blah. She just looks at me and said, how much water are you drinking? <laughs> and I had to go, because I knew. I knew this, and I knew I'm not drinking enough. And so I told her, and she said, you need to be drinking. And she basically went right through this formula. And ever since then, I've been following this. I drink a little over 100 ounces a day. And I thought, man, that's a lot. How am I going to do that? It's not hard. It's easy. And it, it really did take care of things. Just that simple, uh, that simple trick of drinking enough water. Now, you can get by with less. You know, you can live with less. But uh, uh, this, is, this is the optimal amount. Drinking plenty of water is an investment toward good health. And then there's the S, sunshine. We have a problem with this sometimes in the Pacific Northwest, don't we? In the Willamette Valley, um, fog and everything that, that settles in here. Scripture says in John 8, 12, Jesus is the light of the world. Again, what a wonderful metaphor because we need light. We've got to have light. We need sunlight to live. I'm going to ask you a question. Don't raise your hand. Do you ever get what's called uh, the winter blues? Um, you know, the technical term is seasonal affective disorder or SAD, S-A-D. That's, that's appropriate. Um, it's, a, it's a concern here in the Northwest, you know, just because of the long winters. Uh, it's natural. It, be, it brings on a natural depression, and it comes from the reduced exposure to sunlight. Now, some of the symptoms of this are weight gain. Okay, now oftentimes I think I gain weight in the wintertime because of Christmas, but it's some of us because I'm not getting enough sunlight. Okay, there's weight gain. Decreased ability to concentrate. Okay, not getting enough sunlight. Fatigue. Um, increased sleeping during the winter months. And it's estimated some 60 million people in the United States, especially in the north, are affected by it. We need daylight. We got to get sunlight uh, to live. Now, if you think you have this, I'm going to tell you: talk to your doctor, okay? Because they're going to, your doctor is going to give you, you know, can find out if there's other things going on. I can give you my prescription, though, to try get outside, even on cloudy days. Uh, even on a cloudy day, you can get light that will help to counteract this. Open your curtains at home. I would go visit people. You know, when I was a church pastor, I'd visit my members. And I can't 
tell you how many times I'd go into a home that would be totally closed off. The blinds are drawn, just dreary inside. And I go in and, and you know, try and help people through some of their problems. And the first thing I want to say is, open your blinds. <laughs> get some light in here. You know, just get cheer up your, your atmosphere. Open up your curtains. Get as much exposure to daylight as you can. We need it. What sunlight does, and I don't understand this, I think there's probably a physician or two here that could explain it, but somehow sunlight helps vitamin D uh, form in your skin. Now, vitamin D uh, fights breast cancer. It fights colon cancer. It fights arthritis and, and a host of other ailments. Sunlight destroys bacteria, kills, kills viruses. It helps to lower your cholesterol. Sunlight helps to lower your blood pressure. So exposure to sunshine is an investment in good health. You know, and as I'm going through these things, I'm thinking, you know, God revealed something to our sister Ellen White, didn't he? You know, that she knew this in 1905 before we did all this research. And then we have the T, which is the temperance, that abstemiousness word that was in what she wrote. But temperance. Temperance means moderation sometimes. Okay, not all the time. Um, because we can overdo a good thing, can't we? If you get too much sunlight, guess what? <laughs> you get skin cancer, okay? So you gotta be, uh, you gotta be temperate in that. The Kegleys, I, I told you, were overweight. They're vegetarians, they were overweight because they were intemperate vegetarians. They ate good food. They just ate way too much of it, you know, way more than they needed. Too much exercise you know, can cause injuries, so you gotta be careful about that. Just get, get the right amount. You know, so we need to be moderate in the good things. A better definition, I think, is self-controlled. Uh, in Titus 1 and 2, those first two chapters of Titus, you will see that Paul encourages us five times there, be self-controlled, self-control, self-control. See, the problem with moderation is, you know, I can use moderation to rationalize a lot of things. I can be a moderate smoker and still die of lung cancer, okay? I can be a moderate drinker and still act like an idiot or get behind the wheel of a car and kill people, okay? So moderation, you can't just take that for everything. So true temperance, this letter T, is to take the good things in moderation and avoid the bad things altogether. Okay, that's true temperance, and it's an investment towards good health. The A is air. Uh, when God formed Adam from the dirt of the ground, I just love this image that we get in Genesis. He, he makes Adam out of dirt, out of clay, and then breathes into him the breath of life. Air is life. You know, you can live weeks without food. You can live days without water. But you can only live minutes without air. Now, research, again, has shown us, you know, long after Ellen White wrote these words, that there's a link between a lack of oxygen, and hardening of the arteries, diabetes, glaucoma, cancer, hypertension, arthritis, okay? And again, the list goes on. And so fresh air, taking in lots of air, it increases your resistance to infections. It helps you think more clearly. It helps you relax. You know, we know that. If you need to calm down, take a deep breath. It helps to lower your blood pressure. Again, good, fresh air is what she said. And so Richard had the right approach uh, to health. He chose a form of exercise that got him outdoors. It got him out into the daylight. It got him out into the, the fresh air. Now, you can take, do deep breathing exercises. That'll help. But when you do that, you want to make sure you're breathing from your stomach and not your chest to really fill up your lungs with that 
oxygen. Air out your house. You know how many I, pollutants are in your house, you know, from furniture and carpets and that sort of thing. Get your house aired out. Get good fresh air in your house. Uh, stay away from people who smoke. Now, maybe you don't have that option. Maybe you live with somebody like that. But, uh, you know, as much as you can, secondhand smoke, I was surprised by this, kills 50,000 non-smoking Americans a year. Secondhand smoke. People that don't smoke are still being killed by someone else's smoke. Don't be one of those people, okay? So breathing fresh air, an investment towards good health. The R is rest. You know, uh, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said this. He said, come to me. If you're weary and you're tired and you're burdened, he said, come to me and I will give you rest. Jesus wants us to rest. Now, Richard understood this. You know, he had this very intense exercise program, but Richard understood God gave us the gift of rest when he gave us the Sabbath. Oh, day of rest and gladness that we sang about. Uh, it's part of an investment in good health. So Richard said this. You know, people would ask him, you know, how do you, you know, how have you been able to, to do all this running, you know, with the condition that you were in? And he would always tell people, everybody's got to have a day of rest. Okay, everybody, everybody's body needs a day of rest, a time to recover. And then he would tell them, I am glad that God gave us such a day. It's called the Sabbath. And he could use that as an opportunity to witness to his faith and tell people about this wonderful day of rest that God has given to humanity. He says, God gave us that day, the Sabbath, for that very purpose. And he said, it helps me to have a positive outlook on life, which is an important key to running a race. You know, so he's doing interviews with people like Runner's World, you know, in secular magazines, and he's telling them about the Sabbath. This is a strategy for running races. And he was able to use that as an opportunity to witness. Again, temperance is the key uh, to getting good rest. If you get too little rest, you know, eventually you become a blithering idiot because of sleep deprivation. Um, but if you get too much rest, pretty soon your friends will start attaching nicknames to you like couch potato and sofa slug. You know, so you gotta get just the right amount. Okay, not too much, not too little. And what we see is that all of these are tied together. If you're exercising properly, you actually eat less. Okay, your, your appetite becomes more attuned to what your body actually needs, and you will sleep better. Ecclesiastes 5.22 says this. Some of you know this well. The sleep of a laborer is sweet. You know, those of you who, who work physical manual labor, I used to work on the railroad. I was the guy that was going out there, you know, doing track repair, driving spikes and all of that stuff. I can tell you what, I slept good at night. <laughs> I did not have any trouble sleeping uh, when I was doing that physical manual labor. Rest is an investment toward good health. And then the T, trust in God. You know, John 14, 27, Jesus says this. He says, my peace I give to you. Trust in God. My peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. You know, let God take care of that anxiety. Trust in him. Let him lower your stress level and your hypertension and all of that. You know, there are times, all of these things we can do. 
We can eat better. We can exercise. We can drink water. We can get out in the sunshine. You know, we can be temperate. We can get air. We can get rest. But sometimes even all of that is not enough. There are times when you just got to lay it at God's feet and say, now I'm yours, Lord. I'm putting my life into your hands, and I'm going to trust you to do what I can't do. That next bit that I have no control over. Now, researchers in uh, Southern California, again, research is proving what Ellen White said in this passage in, in Ministry of Healing. Researchers in Southern California found that el elderly people who trust God are more optimistic, they're better able to cope with illness, and they are less lonely than those who don't trust in God. What a surprise. <laughs> Jesus' words were true. He does give his peace to us. Well, this helped Richard on his run, on that race. For five days, he just put one foot in front of the other. He said, I did not know which step was going to be my last. <laughs> he said, because I thought I was going to die running this race. He said, but I trusted God. I trust the Lord to keep me going. So on Thursday, August 6th, okay, he started on August 1 there in Death Valley on August 6th. He's at the Whitney Portal, 6,500 feet from the top of Mount Whitney, 11 miles to go, 11 miles of trails uh, to finish off this race. He's already run 135 miles, okay, so he's got the last stretch to go. He had to do it on his own. Um, his wife and his two grandkids all along had followed him with a motorhome. Okay, they were his support team, but here they had to stop. They couldn't go any farther because it was just trails, just hiking trails the rest of the way. So Richard said, from here on, it's me and God. <laughs> okay, this is how we're going to get there. <clears throat> now he knew he had to keep a certain schedule. He had to get to the top by 1.30 in the afternoon because he figures if he's there at 1.30, that'll give him enough time to get back because now he's worried that if he's not back in time, the temperature drops up there and he's afraid that that drop in temperature, well, he's in a pretty weakened state. And uh, he says, you know, if, if that temperature drops and I'm not down off of that mountain back at the motorhome, it, he realizes that that could kill him. So step by step, climbing on the trail, air's getting thin, his head starts aching. He realizes he's starting to get altitude sickness now, uh, going up uh, at that, that elevation. He's desperately sucking air. You know, he's fearing that uh, he's got oxygen deprivation. He gets to the point now where he can't even see the trail clearly, you know, because of these conditions, but he could see the gaps in the boulders. And so he just kept running towards those gaps in the boulders, but then he saw it. The cabin at the top of the summit at Mount Whitney. In a couple of minutes, he's at the top. Uh, he took pictures, you know, to prove I really made it to the top, signed the register, and then he turned to right around to go right back down. So I got to get right back down there. But that's when the real trouble hit. You know, those of you that, that, that hike, uh, do some climbing, you know, go, go hike up, oftentimes it's the trip down that's the hardest. You think that it's going up that would be the hardest, but coming down, uh, it's the pressure on your joints, on your legs, and, and twisting ankles and that sort of thing. And so on the way down, he realizes, I'm in big trouble because his, his legs start wobbling and his joints just start throbbing. And I got 11 miles of this to do. Um, he's not sure he's going to be able to do it. So he needed, I told you that we're going to talk about new start plus F. He needed the F in New Start plus F, which is this, fellowship. 
He needed fellowship. You know, James 5.16 says, Pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now, those of you elders in this church, you've probably uh, read this verse in the context of anointing services, haven't you? This is the passage that we look at. God says we need each other. We need to pray for each other. We need the prayers of each other. You know, when I think about this, now it's, it's come home to me. You know, recently we've, uh, we've seen the news, you know, Alex Trebek, uh, the Jeopardy guy, has just diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. Uh, he has a good, positive outcome, but anyone who knows anything about that knows there's about a two-month, you know, it's about a, a two-month time frame. One of our dear sisters, a dear friend, one of my church members, I was pastor in Lebanon years ago, one of my church members over there, a few years back, diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. Some of you may know her. Um, and so she's determined, I'm going to go through the treatments, but she called me up, Pastor Chuck, I need an anointing. And several of us went over to her home right after that diagnosis. We did the anointing service for her. And uh, like I said, this, they had told her six months. Okay, you, you have six months. That's on the outside. Um, I was in Lebanon, what, about three months ago. And she told me, she's still there. This was a few years back. We did the anointing. She just got her contractor's license so that she can continue to run the family business. Not only did she beat it, but she's moving forward with her life. Why? She went through the treatments. She did her doctor's orders and everything, but she followed the counsel of God. Is anyone sick? Have the, the faithful church members come and pray and anoint you with oil. There are times when we need fellowship. We need the prayers of our brothers and sisters, and we need to be praying for our brothers and sisters. Sometimes, you know, you're going to start, let's say now, a, a, a health program. Um, you probably need the encouragement of others to stick with it. <laughs> you know, you need accountability people to help you that'll maybe go through it with you. Sometimes we need those intercessory prayers of our brothers and our sisters. Hebrews 10.25, here's a bonus verse for you. Hebrews 10.25 says this, Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but encourage one another. He's saying we need to be at church. We need to come here not only uh, so that we can be encouraged, but God has called us to be encouragers for others. The fellowship is what we need. We need our church family. And I believe that it's an investment in good health. And so Richard is heading down, and he's all alone. It's him and God, but he's all alone, and he's not sure how he's going to make it. Some hikers on the trail had just heard, Richard, this, that old guy that you saw, he just finished the, that toughest run in the world, the Death Valley to Mount Whitney run. That guy, 68 years old, can you believe that? He just finished it. So these people, they gathered around and they surrounded him and they, they talked to him on the way down. They encouraged him. Uh, they gave him water. They, they, they pointed out things to take his mind off of his, of his aching legs and his, his wobbly legs. And uh, he, they, they just ran with him step by step until he was back down. The fellowship is what saved him. We need fellowship, folks. We need the fellowship of our brothers and sisters. So again... With the help of these principles, Richard beat these overwhelming odds, following the plan from God's word. He went from his hospital bed 
to conquering the world's toughest run in 10 years. Now, if you happen to uh, go to the uh, Walla Walla University Alumni Weekend, or if you just happen to be in College Place uh, during that Alumni Weekend, it's, it's every April. On Sunday morning of that weekend, you can take part in the Richard J. Kegley Memorial Fun Run and Walk. Uh, they still honor and remember Richard there. By following God's principles, uh, Richard went from his hospital bed to having a 5K fun run named after him. What a testimony to God's healing power. You know, it's amazing what we can do when we partner with God, when we follow his principles, when we join our efforts to his health principles. And so the wish is from uh, 3 John verse 2, God wants us to have good health. He says, I wish, I pray for you to have good health. And as you dedicate your life, dedicate your mind, your body, your soul to God, the return on your investment is health and happiness. That's the way he wants us to live. And it goes a long way towards your investment in heaven. Now, <clears throat> if you want to... Uh, if you want to find Richard's story, I can't find mine anymore. I put it in a file. It's, it's somewhere. If, you, if somewhere you can dig up Signs of the Times, Times magazine, November 1988 has Richard's story in it. I, I wish I could find mine, but uh, that's where you'll find Richard uh, Kegley's story. If you can find someone that has Signs of the Times, November 1988. Now, you've got to tell me, it's, it's 20 minutes after 10. Do we, do we wrap up now? Do we do something for a few more minutes? Or 10 more minutes? Sure. <laughs> That's right. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that uh, you have given us uh, your prescription for a happy and a healthy life, and that you've told us that when we follow that, uh, not only will we enjoy a better life, but it's an investment in this church uh, family. It's an investment in this community. It's an investment in growing your kingdom. I pray, Lord, that you will guide us each day to live our lives, to dedicate every part of our lives to you, and uh, that as we do, that you will show us your love, give us your peace, and may we be a blessing to others as we do this. Bless this congregation now as we move on to our next service. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.